right. Thank you, Dan and Nicola, for, for having me tonight. Thank you, everyone, for coming out and spending a little time with us. Um, I'm going to share a little bit about some work we've been doing for the past eight or nine years, uh, if we go back to the early moments of uh, uh, the thinking that's represented here. We were really focused on, or taking a step back and looking at, um, you know, trying to understand the cloud and networks and what it does well to bring a great experience uh, to end users and what it, where it suffers and, you know, what, what, what results in a poor experience from that type of, a, of, of approach. So we're going to just walk through a little bit of the rationale for the work, and some observations, a little bit about what we've done so far, some data, and then we'll, uh, we'll close. <clears throat> so again, when you, when you take a step back and think about content creation, I'm going to have to kind of stay this way, I guess, right? Um, content creation, when people create, want to create great content, um, they want to have that great experience go far and wide, of course, right? So people really are in this mindset of the creation and playback. But, you know, there's an assumption that there's a straight wire between creation and playback. That's what we want, right? And the legacy way of thinking about the straight wire um, is traditional ways of distributing content. Things like over-the-air television, cable, satellite, disc-based uh, media, things like DVD, Blu-ray, so on and so forth. This type of uh, distribution mechanism is very deterministic in nature. Its uh, information carrying capacity is, is well known. It's, it'll, it'll give you 100% uh, uh, quality day in, day out, 24-7, pretty much, um, you know, 365, right? It's a very, very predictable um, distribution uh, uh, methodology, all of them. But then there's this thing called the network. Um, and we'd like to even think that it's even multiple networks, multiple clouds. This thing is very, very different um, when it comes to uh, one, you know, distributing information, particularly media. This thing is a highly interconnected set of communication channels, as you know, where those uh, communication channels converge at nodes in the network. You know, not only do they relay information these days, they can uh, store information, they can process the information as well, and that continues to grow. But the important property um, of this system to remind ourselves of, and many people in this room uh, work to overcome this uh, every day as well, is it's an, a non-deterministic system. It's very dynamic. Its information carrying capacity is, and its state is always kind of in flux. It's very unpredictable in many ways. Um, and as an example <coughs> of this uncertainty and unpredictability, um, here's some data from three days, about a year ago, in the Chicago area. Uh, we, we were measuring time to first byte, making requests across three, to three CDNs, three tier one CDNs, and looking at the time to first byte. <clears throat> and you can see that the range of time to first byte values across that three-day period, uh, you know, um, fluctuated drastically. And in some cases, and I'm sorry, it's kind of bright in here. You can't see the screen too well. So, but um, in some cases, um, all three of the CDNs were suffering some uh, degradation simultaneously. So again, very, very um, uh, troublesome environment. It's like noise. Uh, and the player is trying to, you know, make sense of this and trying to adapt its behavior based on what it sees here, of course. Um, if you look at, um, um, I don't think it kind of jumped, jumped across the slide. Okay, if you look at um, another area, this is actually in, uh, I think this was Dallas, um, about a year ago again, time to first byte. These are absolute values, not looking at the entire range across those three days, but this is a, you know, part of a day in Dallas. Again, lots of um, variance here. Again, the player's got to work hard to try to deliver a really good experience to end users. If we look at all-out request failures um, across the U.S. and all the regions that we tested, again, this just continues to kind of reinforce that it is a challenging environment. Um, and ABR, of course, is one mechanism we use to try to overcome this uncertainty and, and adapt the experience accordingly, of course. Um, but I think we can, we can do better if we 
you know, twist it a little bit, and you'll hear more about this in a minute. So again, there's this gap in QOE, trying to close that gap between these traditional ways of, of, of doing delivery or um, delivering experiences um, versus trying to move them across um, very dynamic, non-deterministic environments like the network. So again, the premise here is you can't have good QoE without good QoS, network you know, side QoS. They, they, they go together. So with that said, um, and going back several years, we thought, geez, <clears throat> lots of good work's going on, both in academia and around industry, um, making the existing coding methods work reasonably well in, um, in these types of settings. But we thought, geez, why, why are we still coding and representing the media um, in a manner that was really targeted at legacy ways of distributing the content? So again, coders like MPEG, all the, the entire lineage of MPEG video coders, Dolby audio coders, MPEG audio coders, they're all perceptually motivated, of course, but they were all developed with this type of distribution in mind. That was the target application. Sorry, I gotta, gotta stay in the pocket here or else we lose my mic. Um, so it's a very channel-centric or, ch or channel-based mindset, of course. Delivering media today over, over the cloud um, and over networks, of course, we have multiple information sources, and that's, that's the key thing to remember um, in this discussion. In this case, a lot of um, services out there use a multi-CDN strategy and switch between them, of course. In this case, I have three CDNs, and we're storing basically fully redundant or duplicated media across all of those information sources in the network. And of course, as you already know, uh, we're drawing from one of them at a given time based on some CDN management software that's either, you've either, um, let's say, um, signed up for, um, there's some services out there, or else uh, built your own type of thing. So this is all, again, you know, uh, part and parcel of the way things work today. But again, going back to this new thinking, is there a way to better use that infrastructure and take better advantage of the multiple information sources that are available today with current infrastructure. And this is what led us to this, you know, at least this initial thinking on, can we re-architect the media representation itself? Can we code the media in such a way so that we can leverage multiple information sources simultaneously without fear of downloading lots of redundant information from the sources? And that led us to this thing called XCD1. That's what we've, that's the technology that we've been uh, develop, researching and developing over the past several years. XCD1 stands for Experience Coding and Delivery Number One. Got to start somewhere. And I'm going to just walk you through a toy example of how the coding works. This isn't meant to be a full um, treatise on the subject. Um, if you want to connect with me later, we can, I can, we can exchange numbers or emails, and I'd be happy to, uh, to get together with you um, on a call at some point if you want to learn more and dive a little deeper, of course. Due to time, we don't have uh, uh, the, the ability to go super, super deep tonight. Okay, so this toy example is going to be um, focused on the use of three information sources, three CDNs, three commercially available CDNs are out there, um, and it's just a toy example. So we start on the left-hand side. We start with source-coded um, assets that are packaged in pick your format, Dash, HLS. Doesn't matter whether it's MPEG video, um, AV1, doesn't really matter. We're agnostic to that. So let's say so we start with the first segment. <coughs> we pull the first segment into our process, and we partition that um, first segment into um, a number of symbols. So in this toy example, we partition the first segment of that packaged asset into three symbols, X1, X2, and X3, okay? Again, it's still, the segment hasn't changed at all. It's still the same thing. We're just kind of like indexing our symbol boundaries. We're gonna say, okay, I made three, three symbols, and now I'm gonna go through a linear transformation process, which is lossless, and we're gonna generate a number of linearly independent representations or linear combinations of the original X1, X2, and X3 symbol that's, that's inside the first um, uh, segment. 
And in this case, because we're working with three CDNs, we generate nine functionally equivalent symbols. We start with three, and we generate nine. Um, here are these linear combinations inside, this, uh, inside each of these um, uh, copies of the first segment. Those, um, the way we do the coding is um, uh, we, we have to use some metadata to guide the coding process and obviously guide the decoding process, and that metadata is negligible. It's, it's the size of it is probably, let's say for a four and a half megabit um, segment of video on average, it's under 1%. So it's not a lot of additional information is required to drive this type of process. Um, <clears throat> we then take that information just like we did in, the, in, in today's scenario or do in today's scenario and store it uh, in the CDN or it can be requested and cached as requests come in just like, uh, just like normal. The next question that comes to mind with uh, many folks is, hey, our CDN's a requirement here and know what they're not. CDNs are convenient today because everybody's using CDNs and they're a very powerful way to improve the media experience, of course. Um, but you can use this method or technique for peer-assisted or peer-to-peer -peer based approaches or anywhere the, any, anywhere the client can access the media in the cloud, it doesn't matter, right? So things like open caching, peer-assisted approaches are also um, applicable to this, uh, uh, the, this method. Okay. So back to the, back to the uh, toy example here. So now you've got these um, coded copies, um, these functionally equivalent coded uh, copies out in, the, uh, in each of your CDNs. And the client can now make requests to all of them simultaneously. Um, and in this example, all I need to do is the client needs to receive three of those coded symbols out of its universe of nine that are available. So this, in, in this ex toy example here, you can see the cloud and the network and the servers inside the CDN were able to deliver two coded um, symbols from CDNA and one from C, the fastest. So right now we're biased towards performance. Um, Let's say another client somewhere has made a request to the same CDNs and the state changed a bit, it's a different region, whatever it may be, and now two coded symbols are coming from B and one from C. And that allows us, again, we have three unknowns, three coded symbols, gives us the ability to, to recover the X1, X2, and X3. That's all we're doing here. If two CD, oh, hey Ben. That's the metadata, that's the coding coefficient. Okay. Yeah, yep, yep. So, okay. um, so in the case, here's another example. If two CDNs go down or they un become unresponsive, the client just waits a little longer for uh, three symbols to be downloaded from CDN C. So effectively, what this is doing is it's allowing us to take advantage of the time-varying residual capacity of the servers, the links between them in a, in a kind of um, organic way without having to be guided or orchestrated from, central, from a central orchestration layer that's telling it where to go next. The player's in the best position to make those types of uh, decisions on, on quality, of course. So just to um, close this section out, again, there's a number of combinations out of that original nine that are perfectly valid for decoding and recovering X1, X2, and X3. This is all linear algebra. <laughs> That's all it is. Here's a nice uh, animation that a colleague of mine uh, uh, had made that kind of gives you a different view of how things work. Again, in this example, we, have, we start with nine blocks. Nine are stored in each, so any nine out of the 27 give you the ability to recover. And again, this process is lossless. We're not doing any perceptual um, um, type of coding here. It's a purely lossless process, and it's agnostic to the um, transport uh, protocols in use. You can use it with any transport protocol, and it's also agnostic to the source coding that's being used. Okay. So what this is really 
doing for you is improving the net network performance the client sees, right? Again, we're trying to denoise things here, we're trying to think, make things more stable, present a great network um, to the client more often than not, and it can make better decisions and actually lift the QOE um, accordingly. So we go from, going back to this example, we go from a view that may look like this, um, that same three-day span with this multi-source approach, that's what you get. So essentially, we've denoised the, uh, the infrastructure. We're using the same infrastructure we're using today. We're just using it a little bit differently. I wish Ray Dolby were still around, because this is uh, something that I think he would uh, uh, smile about, because it, it kind of, there's, it, it's analogous to kind of what he was doing in the early days of noise reduction in the 60s. All he wanted to do was improve the fidelity of the medium um, that was being used in the day, the magnetic tape. This is improving the fidelity of the network, right, that's presented to the media player. If we look at the, uh, that Dallas example, um, similar thing. Um, so in summary, again, this, if this, this approach, this efficient use of multipath gives us the ability to minimize and eliminate this complex, uh, complex path switching and or download scheduling. We no longer care which packets or which information we download, we just care about the number. Um, we don't require any um, analytics to run this thing. The client doesn't need to be told from somewhere to go here now and go there a uh, moment later, so on and so forth, of course. Another unique thing is this type of coding. No coordination was required when operating in distributed or decentralized settings. So you can move this, this encoding process deeper into the network, and the encoders don't need to uh, coordinate with each other with this approach. And that's really important for, for network operators. They don't want to, the less orchestration, the better, because um, their networks are so complex. And again, this, we believe this natively addresses this non-determinism, this non-deterministic nature of these networks without having to control it. Okay, how about, how does this look? All great, wonderful, cool, good. How does this look in a real world setting? You know, how does the, what's the architecture look like? And then what are some, um, some performance uh, uh, data that we've, uh, we've put together that we can share with you here. So the architecture, again, highly simplified here uh, for the talk, but um, it's basically um, like this. <clears throat> we start with, um, you know, we have a just-in-time encode process that creates these coded uh, variants that we talked about earlier. That runs in the cloud, could be any cloud, doesn't really matter. Um, so it's a request-based thing. We connect to your, the content origin, requests that come in for XCD1 traffic. We intercept those requests, go back to origin, grab it, code it, distribute it to the CDNs, of course. We have uh, um, an SDK that goes in, uh, we have SDKs available for Android, ExoPlayer, and iOS uh, right now. And um, we also have, um, and over the past several years as part of this work, had to develop um, an analytics capability and data platform to be able to provide a yardstick on how this performs against status quo, right? Um, so we've spent a lot of time developing uh, um, an analytics uh, a layer as well and data analysis uh, platform too, so um, that was an important part of this work. A little deep review inside the uh, um, client SDK that we have. Again, we've got the core decoder itself that we talked about. Uh, we got a flow control uh, algorithm mechanism. We have a, uh, um, a, uh, uh, a bandwidth estimator because we're aggregating throughput across multiple links. You gotta you do something a little different there in terms of bandwidth estimation. Um, and um, the metrics uh, we just talked about, and again, that's all abstracted into an SDK that plugs into, uh, into the player side of things. So it's pretty straightforward. Um, okay, a real world trial. <clears throat> We've been uh, um, working with Andre Silva at uh, Curiosity Stream. Curiosity Stream is a, is a uh, OTT service uh, based on the East Coast. They provide uh, content worldwide. It's primarily, um, documentary and educational content. 
Um, we've known Andre a long time. He's been very gracious with his, uh, his time, his team, and his platform in helping us kind of vet this approach um, worldwide um, and in different settings. So we're really, really grateful for his, uh, his, uh, his work with us and partnership with us. So the current trial, um, and we've ran several with him, the current one has been running continuously since last September. And we're um, taking on uh, between, I think it's between 50 and 75% of their Android uh, traffic with this approach. Uh, I'd have to check on the latest number with the field team, but I, um, as of a couple months ago, we were in that range. So a substantial amount of traffic, just to try to pressure test this, this new approach. So if we look at like March, April, and I pulled, a, I got another slide from June. I just went to the database today and uh, pulled out aggregated results for June. This is, uh, this is what, again, summary, the summary statistics look like against um, uh, traditional. And, and Andre, Curiosity Stream's traditional approach here is a traditional multi-CDN switched environment. They're using the, the you know, standard off-the-shelf multi-CDN selection, um, and that's what we're comparing uh, to. So you can see here with uh, mobile cellular, the average bitrate gain, we're, we're getting up 21% higher. Uh, startup time, we're lowering by uh, 37%, so on and so forth. So we're seeing some nice gains. And again, the gains are varied. In some cases, the average bit rates are uh, more limited because it could be the content, you know, educational content, documentary content might not be as demanding on, on bit rate and things like that. Could be a whole host of things here. But um, he's very pleased with uh, how things are going with this, and we are too, and we're learning a lot. Um, again, um, historically, Dolby's a signal processing company. <laughs> you know, we've had to learn a lot about this whole space in the past, you know, eight, nine, ten years, and we're still learning. Um, uh, about uh, about uh, the do's and don'ts uh, of this uh, this stuff. So if you look at them, um, I just again as I said earlier today before I came over, I went and pulled um, the aggregated results by uh, device and access type. Access type means uh, mobile, wireless, and um, Wi-Fi. And this this expression is a little different. That you can see the traditional single uh, path multi CDN approach, the raw values the multi-source, and the delta in green down at the bottom. So the average bit rate's up a little bit. Startup time's down 45%. Uh, connection to rebuffering ratio, ratio re rebuffering ratio, sorry, uh, down about 82%, and the number of events per session is down 51% with this approach. Um, another way we look at the data uh, real quick, again, we use these empirical CDFs. And you can see here, one thing that was really important to Curiosity Stream was moving um, a number of uh, viewers below the three second start time threshold. And you can see here we did a substantial job of, uh, of, um, uh, of, of doing that um, with this, again, with this approach. Um, standardization, everybody asks, are you gonna standardize any of this? And the answer is yes. We have been working for several years on developing a, uh, a, a standard, a specification, I should say, that we wanted to take to standardization. And for the past um, year, we've been um, working with a number of Etsy members um, to submit a work item in, uh, in Etsy, in the JTC broadcast um, area. And uh, we have the work item approved, and we're in the drafting phase as we speak and working through uh, that process. And what this standard is, is meant to do, it's, a, it's an extensible interchange format. It's kind of like a container for multi-source coded media. And of course, we're going to specify the syntax and semantics for the XCD1 code, but if, you, if another code came along in the future or somebody else had another code, it could be um, put into this container format and a code point assigned and uh, we, it would be supported. We just don't want this to be fragmented, this world of multi-source to be fragmented from the start. We're, we really want to bring the community together and uh, focus on um, doing what's best for um, the 
consumers, you know, people that consume our media and consume um, the great things that are put together, um, that people spend so much time uh, putting together and so much time making the infrastructure work and want to deliver the best experience at all times to all endpoints. So um, a little bit, just a graphic of where the CMMF, the coded multi-source media format uh, standard, which is the working title of the document, now subject to change, of course, is between the encoder, the CDN, and or storage, and uh, that entity, and the player. Again, similar to what ISO BMMF um, had done, it's close to CMAF, I know. <laughs> You know, so and we, we had a debate on that. You know, we had a debate on that. But, um, but we wanted to say what it was, coded multi-source media format. So again, we want the feedback in the process to see if uh, there's a better, better terminology or better name, a naming convention for this yet. So uh, definitely. Um, so in summary, you know, kind of the question at the at the uh, at the outset of the of the of the talk here, we think that rearchitecting the media can make a difference. Um, this type of representation and the availability of multiple information sources that exist in the network, we should be thinking about how to leverage them um, in the best way possible and in 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 an efficient way. Of course, we want to. We don't want to be downloading lots of redundant information, you know, from those sources too. But um, so we're excited about that. Again, the existing infrastructure is in place to support this type of thing. We're doing it right now with commercial CDNs. No change to, you know, we're just using standard distributions. We set up an XCD1 distribution for each of the CDNs, and away we go. Um, nothing, nothing proprietary is needed there. And again, the multi-source uh, benefits we talked about earlier um, as well. And I'd be remiss if I didn't give a shout out to the entire team that's been working on this for uh, a handful of years. And we have many more beyond research, some of our colleagues in, uh, in engineering and uh, in the business areas and things like that. So um, it takes a village, right, <laughs> to make all this stuff work. And it takes a village of passionate folks, and this is, uh, um, this is the, the group that's been noodling on this for a while. So with that, I uh, thank you for your time. You. Sorry, quick question. Um, on the graph, so you're grabbing three out of nine possible sets of data. Are those just separate byte ranges? Is that what it yes, is? Yes, yeah, we do byte range requests. Okay. Yes. Yep. Cool. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, you'll bring the microphone around, uh, Dan will. Yeah, I actually do something very similar for that, but with a different application, uh, object storage. And I'm yeah. wondering, like, have you patented this? Is, are we going to bump into your patent <laughs> when we try to use this? Gonna behave for me here? Okay. So there, there have been patents filed for uh, some of the technologies you've seen here, for sure. Yep. <laughs> we'll talk after. Yeah. Happy to chat. I'm curious if you guys yeah. have uh, worked on live sports with this platform. Uh, it's kind of a three-part question. Yep. Live sports issues are delay. Yep. Like, does this improve delay? And what about lip sync? Are you concerned about syncing these, you know, as these feeds are coming across multiple CDNs? You hit it right on the head. You got typically three CDNs. If one fails, you move to the next, et cetera. Yep. Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, no, it's a great, great question. We are actually in the process of standing up a version of this targeted for tar <laughs> yeah, sorry. Yeah, targeted for, for live streaming applications. So that's an active um, body of work right now internally. So hopefully in the next six months, we can come back and give you more information on how that went. We do believe this has um, applicability there, um, both on the resilience side. There's no impact to, um, uh, to sync. Uh, there'll be no impact at, at all because of the coding. Um, and your last question was the... Well, it was about uh, 
Triumph, oh, the, the Triumph delay. Triumph Live Sports delay. Yes, yeah, yes. Delay yeah. is the biggest. Delay, definitely. So we, we, we do have to do some tuning to get the delay down, but the encode time right now, if I recall looking at our dashboard for the Curiosity Stream that's um, a trial that's been running, to do the coding is about 10 milliseconds. Uh, I think that was the median value. Um, it, I think it actually takes longer to write it to the network and even read it from the disk you know, than it does to do the coding. I would think that if you were maximizing the network mm -hmm. on the delivery, mm -hmm. that the delay would decrease just could based, be, on, could, based on the theory. Yes, you can see by the start times in the data, we've dropped it significantly. Yeah, yeah, so I, I completely agree. There's a, there's a lot there I think we want to understand to see how much value it can bring there. So I think it's, our, we're very optimistic. <laughs> yeah, very optimistic. Andy. Yeah. You said agnostic. So quick, UDP, HTTP. Doesn't matter. Yep. Mm, so my paramutual wagering app controlling my player decides to ban any CDNs that are late mm -hmm. because that might lead to cheating. But your slide doesn't it me all. You, you use the word segment. You don't mean seg could be a fragment, right? The the group the group of coded symbols represents the original segment. Yes, but we code over partitioned portions of that segment to create the coded symbols. Well, wait a minute. Does that mean I have to encode stuff with one frame gops, or can I? It doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't matter. It's agnostic to that. Yep. It's just data. It's just a string of bits. So, so if I want to be fall down, fall back compatible to fragmented, to dash IF low latency with fragments accumulating into segments, this still works. I, my blocks can be my fragments. Yes. Thank you. Yep. All right, great. So that's, we're going to wrap up the questions and move on to the next round here. We've got to uh, stay on schedule a little bit. So thank you so much for the questions. If there's any more, he's available thank after. And a great thank round you. of applause. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We'll take one minute here for switch out. If anyone needs to use the restroom or get a beer, please feel free. But just enter back quietly.